Is it in the wrong place? That's better, good. Um, like so many other projects, this one started because existing tools sucked in some way or other. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different bootloaders. They're all different and they all suck in different ways. They've all got different configuration techniques. They've all got different scripting languages. I hate it. <laughs> so this started out because of the BeagleBoard. BeagleBoard's a really nice little OMAP based processor. That particular one's the OMAP XM. I've got a C3 revision BeagleBoard just sitting on my, the desk here. They're, they're a really nice machine. They've got, uh, this one's got USB host ports. It's got five volts input. It's got audio in and out. It's got HDMI out. Uh, it's got an Ethernet here. It's got something else there. I can't, oh, that's right, an SD card. And, a little, it's, and there's a micro SD card slot on the other side of the board that you can't see. So it's all really, really nice as a development platform. But how do you actually develop with the XM? Well, first, you've got a build machine somewhere that's got all the cross-compilers that are standard for your environment on it. So you SSH to that one and type make, wait for a little bit. And then you get an image. But the image is not local, it's on the build machine. So the next thing you've got to do is copy it onto your local machine. But before you do that, you've got to get the SD card out of the XM and plug it into an adapter. So now you've got a full-size SD card. Then you can plug that into a USB adapter. Then you can plug that into your local machine. Then you can copy, it into, copy your new kernel onto it after you've mounted it. Then you can unmount and wait for the slow SD card sync. If you're lucky by now, you have not dropped it on the floor. We have anti-static carpeting in our thing, and it's a dark gray color. The micro SD cards are also dark gray, almost exactly the same color. And you've seen a micro SD card that are about you know, four millimeters across. You can't see them. So then you take the fiddly SD card out, put it back in the XM, and then you can start booting and see what happens. Oh, hang on, this has gone too far. Let me go back a bit. What's going on here? Let me go backwards. It's a, it must be a lightning talk. Yeah, yeah. Light speed talk. Anyway, let's go backwards. You've seen all this stuff now. You've seen all my, you've seen all my jokes. Stop! <laughs> okay. I'll go slowly. I've seen a lot of people having this problem. And then you do it again and again and again. It's like the hokey cokey. <laughs> and at my age, if you've got a knees bend all that time to get the SD card off the floor, it's a real pain. So the XM's got an Ethernet card. Hooray! But the Ethernet's connected by USB. And U-Boot's USB stack isn't up to driving a network in the version that actually works on the BeagleBoard XM. So you can't do a TFTP boot, which would be ideal. And that's where this project started. I want to be able to script in a scripting language that's standard, like Born Shell, TFTP boot across a network on the BeagleBoard. And not just the BeagleBoard, but also the half dozen other different random development boards we have. I don't want to use Red Boot on one of them, U Boot on another one, LAT on another one, and so on. So that's where we are to. We also want to be able to boot automatically and run automatic tests. We want to be able to boot unattended, so at 2 o'clock in the morning after the daily build's going, we want to run a test suite. <coughs> and we're mostly doing kernel embedded development, so we want to replace the kernel each time. The alternatives. U-boot talks Kermit. Yeah. There's also patches to U-boot that lets you use DFU, the Device Firmware Update, Upload Utility. I found that that varies significantly on the quality of your USB cable. And if you've got a good cable, you'll get maybe three out of four uploads that are good, and the other one's not. If you've got a bad cable, you might get one out of ten uploads that are good, and the rest are bad. Is there no error correction in that protocol? Sorry? Is there no error correction in that protocol? Is that what it is? Uh, I don't know. I haven't actually looked into it that closely. The question was, is there no error correction in the protocol? I believe there is, but it does it at the end. So you, you've done all your upload, and then it says bad, bad, bad image. <laughs> so. so what does a bootloader actually do? Well, the first thing it does is it does some kind of initialization of the hardware, enough that it can load a 
kernel and RAM disk off some attached device. And then it might provide some interactive choice of kernel. You've seen Grub, it's got you know, a nice menu. Um, U-boot doesn't have that. You've got to instead name explicitly which kernel file and which NitRAM file you want. And I'll show you that later. It might be split into several stages. And we'll see that in a minute too. Um, it may need to talk to disk or network or SD card or NAND flash or NOR flash or whatever. Doesn't matter. And eventually, once it's got everything into the memory, it can transfer control to the kernel and the kernel can go on from there. This all sounds fairly easy, right? I mean, the bootloader's got device drivers, but so is Linux. The bootloader has file systems and understands some disk layouts, just a few. But Linux has more. Um, the bootloader can talk over a serial line to the user or sometimes via a GUI. Uh, if we're port backporting all this code from Linux into U-boot, why bother with U-boot? <laughs> yeah. And the bootloader can boot another operating system. This was a bit that I thought was missing, but it's not. There's a thing called kexec, which lets Linux boot Linux. And this is really cool. Can we extend it to boot things other than Linux? And the answer is yes, it's already there, which is really neat. But, okay, the alternative would be to fix U-boot. Um, first question is, which code base do you start from? U-boot has uh, dozens of Git repositories. The wikis here, there, and everywhere all disagree on which Git repository to start from. Um, and if you've ever looked at the code inside, it's almost but not quite totally unlike the Linux internal interfaces. So actually backporting stuff and making it work looked like it was more trouble than it was worth. And it doesn't solve the non-standing scripting language problem. So, kexec allows Linux to boot another Linux. Originally, this was designed for big machines. The problem on big machines, well, let's step back a little bit and go back to, say, 1980 on um, Kodak's interactive Unix, which runs on a PC class hardware. It crashes a lot, like Unix did at that stage. And when it crashes, it dumps, its core, it dumps the contents of kernel memory onto the swap device. Then you can load that onto floppies and send them off to your Kodak engineer, and he can look at them and decide, ah, yes, that's the problem, and send you a patch. Big iron users wanted to be able to do the same thing in Linux nowadays. The problem is that when your kernel crashes, you can no longer trust that great big, big SCSI layer and block layer and disk driver to be able to write to the swap device or some other crash device. The solution they came up with was to load another kernel into a predefined area of memory and then on crash, boot into that one, keeping the rest of memory constant. That kernel then has known good drivers so it can read the rest of memory, do whatever compression it wants to and write it out to somewhere so that when they boot back into the main kernel again, you can see all your crash dumps, all your D messages, and all that stuff. Also good. When you had this, we suddenly realized you can make, use it to make booting faster. I don't know whether you've ever tried to boot a 1024 processor machine. It can take hours. Well, halves of hours anyway. It's a truism. The more powerful the machine, the longer it takes to boot. Your little embedded system boots in a few seconds. Your laptop boots in maybe a minute. Your desktop takes two minutes, and your server takes 10. And then when you get to the really big end, it takes much, much longer. So the way it works is there are two user space tools which correspond to two system calls. KXEC L, you load the kernel and the initial RAM disk and maybe a kernel command line into memory. KXEC E then executes the saved kernel. And there's other options for doing the crash dump kernel, which I'm not going to go into. Why is this going wrong? Batteries. Yeah, it could be batteries. I've got another one somewhere. In the meantime, we'll do this. So the ARM KXEC does this. First of all, it shuts down devices and unmounts any file systems. This is the KXEC dash E in some orderly way. It then copies the stashed kernel into contiguous virtual memory. 
because when the kernel boots, it expects to be like that. It then switches to, it turns the MMU off, relocates the kernel into the location it expects to be in, and then passes control to it. So that's all fairly straightforward. Oh, the other thing it does is set up A tags and sets R0 and R1. The way that the ARM kernel works is on an ARM system, you haven't got a BIOS. You can't query the thing to see what's attached and what's not. So hard-coded into Linux is a list of all the platform devices that you expect to find on a particular board. So on the Beagle, you expect to find the USB host, you expect to find all the OMAP peripherals, and you expect to find a few other bits and pieces. And you know where they are in the address space. And all that's hard-coded into Linux. So in register one, there's a board ID tag. Sorry, no, register zero. Register zero contains a board ID tag that says what sort of board you've got. Register one points to the address in physical memory of an A tag structure, which is just a, a tag data structure that contains information about where the initial MAM disk is in memory, where the command line is in memory, how much memory you've got, and all that sort of stuff. All that. So that's all it does. Yeah, I hate this. Here we go. This brings us to the Sharp Sorbus Collie. Unfortunately, I, I left my co Collie at, um, at, in, the, in the hotel. But this device also uses this KXX system. It's only got 16 megabytes of flash. And flashing that memory is error-pone and fiddly. Um, you have to pull that thing down and there's a keyboard behind there. And you've got to hold down the C and D key keys with one hand and then I'd find it easiest to put a stylus in my mouth to push the reset button. Um, it's, it's fiddly. And it's also error prone. Uh, you might get two flashes out of three good, depending. So what they decided to do, especially as the newer kernels would no longer fit into the kernel partition of that 16 megabytes of memory, is take the root and kernel on the SD card that sits in there, and just have a minimal Linux that booted in flash. And that has the KXEC boot, and that's where the KXEC boot um, project started. Very collie specific to start with, it does a few more things now. All that thing does is search the SD card and a compact flash card if there is one, for a directory called boot. And if it finds one, it'll boot the file called zimage that's inside it. It's pretty limited. It uses the KXX system call, like I said. So this is the process. The ROM boots the flash. Then the flash runs KXX boot Linux, which looks at the SD card and boots the final kernel. That way, you only need to flash once. And after that, it's just a matter of pulling the SD card out and putting the data on it that you want. This sounds really nice, doesn't it? It's got a few limit limitations. You can only boot off SD cards and CF cards. It's very collie specific. And the menu that it gives you only gives you the option of booting off the boot partitions, sorry, the, the boot directories that are in the partitions that it recognizes on the SD card or the compact flash card. You still can't boot over the network, you can't boot over serial, and so it's still too limited for what we want. So, let's look at the Beagle boot. This is a three stage bootloader. Again, the ROM starts up. It then looks for MLO, the X loader. At this point, you've only got 64K of memory, of rewrite memory, which is the stuff that's on the OMAP itself. It looks in the flash partition for the magic number. There's NAND, some NAND flash on the board, if you've got a Beagle board C3. Um, and it looks for the X loader in there. If it finds it, it loads it into SDRAM uh, and then executes it. That's MLO. What MLO does is it looks for U-boot in the next partition on in the NAND and then transfer control to it. That then gives you a serial console that you can type at or you can script it using this magic scripting language to say um, boot off the SD card or boot off NAND which because you've got another partition there to play with. There's a little push button up there. If you push that, it changes the order in which the ROM looks for um, for the X-loader. Instead of looking for it in NAND flash, it'll look for it on the SD card. So you can boot the X-loader from the SD card. If you're on the XM version of the Beagle board, 
which is the one that I showed you earlier with the, US, with the Ethernet on it, you don't have any NAND flash, so it will just boot off the SD card always. So, this all looks nice. We want to change this. So what the ROM does is it initializes the 64K SRAM, it initializes a few of the clocks and voltage regulators on chip, initializes the NAND and the MMC if it needs to, It'll only initialize one of them typically. It'll initialize the NAND if it's booting from NAND and the MMC if it's booting from MMC. It looks for the MLO, loads into SRAM and runs it. MLO identifies what sort of what revision of the board you've got, because different revisions have got different amounts of DDR RAM. It then sets up the clocks for the DDR RAM. And after this, we've got 256 or 128 meg of RAM to play with. Much nicer. Looks for a file called uboot.bin either in NAND or on the MMC card loads it and runs it. U-boot initializes some more clocks. It provides the hush command interpreter, which you can script at. And it can boot via, from MMC, NAND, or via Kermit. There are some versions that can boot across a network, but not the version that runs on the BeagleBoard at the moment. So what does Linux need? It needs to be in memory. You can execute in place if you're in ROM or in NOR flash. At the moment, for various reasons, you can't execute in place from NAND flash. You need to know what type of machine you're running on, whether it's a BeagleBoard Revision C3 or a KZM board or a Pleb or whatever. You need to know the addresses of the arguments in the initial RAM, RAM disk. And maybe you need to know the flattened device tree, which gives you more information about what devices are there if this board isn't a standard one that it already knows about. Other operating systems have other requirements. So we're not going to be able to build a complete one-size-fits-all at the moment. Maybe we can. I don't know. They don't. This isn't a new idea. Nishant Menon, in the OMAP tutorial an hour two years ago, managed to get an execute in place version of Linux running instead of Xloader, not on the BeagleBoard, but on a related chip. Um, but he had NOR Flash, so he could do this. Greg Ungerer at the um, Consumer Electronics Linux Found Festival, whatever it's called, I can't remember what CF stands for, uh, it's an embedded Linux conference. He managed to do a similar bootloader for MIPS and Coldfire using Linux. But neither of those projects went anywhere, and I wasn't aware of them when I started this one. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take Linux, I'm going to take the initial RAM disk, I'm going to cat them together, I'm going to put an A tags in the front and a tiny, tiny bootloader at the very front of that. This is the tiny bootloader. It's about 10 instructions. All it does is set oh yeah, R1 to the machine ID, R2 to the A tags. Because the A tags section contains addresses, we need to relocate them um, to wherever we happen to be when, when this code's called. That's really, really trivial to do. And then eventually just branch to the start. Trivial, eh? Doing this makes the uh, combined Linux plus initial RAM disk specific to a particular board because we hard-coded that machine ID. But that's okay, you can do that just before you put it on the, on the, into the NAND flash. And then you've got something like this. Exactly the same with the push button and the ROM. Exactly the same with the XLoader. The XLoader enables the extra memory, we can't get rid of it yet. <clears throat> and then we've got this Linux loader thing which can talk via serial or SSH or whatever. And then it theoretically can talk via network or USB disk or whatever. Sounds easy? I wish. So, so far, I've written a BVAP program which puts the Pico loader in the front, incorporates the, the BZ image, and puts the RAM disk on the end. I've extended UC Linux to build for the Beagle board so I can build a very, very minimal initial RAM disk. And these are Harlequin cotton bunks. They're, they're beautiful. Uh, it's a pity the picture's so dark. Uh, this particular picture's from the Australian Museum, but they're, they're, any hibiscus street tree, you'll find them. They're beautiful. First thing, ARMK exec didn't work. This turned out to be, you know how I said how it turns off the MMU? The bit of code that it turns off the MMU in has to be mapped to identical addresses in physical or virtual space. Otherwise, bad things happen. The ARMK exec code set up the mappings, but then it, it branched to the code 
at its original address, not its new one-to-one -one mapped address. That was easy to fix with a one-line hack, and two weeks ago, um, Will Deacon's patch, which did it properly and worked for more than just my OMAP, um, got in, which was really, really nice. So, that, so that's fixed now. Next problem. Um, the unbezip code in the beginning of Linux in the bootloader, sorry, in, in that loading part at the beginning, assumes that there's a whole heap of space straight after Linux, so it can uncompress the kernel into it. So I overwrote my initial RAM disk. Yeah, right, okay. That one you can solve. Um, inside the kernel config, you can specify the source for initial RAM disk, and that can just be a CPIO file, and it will then include that as a binary blob inside the kernel image. And at that point, it knows where it is, so it won't overwrite it. Oh, good. Last problem. U-boot must set up some clocks that are not reset during the boot sequence, but when you do a k-exec, they're turned off. I got to this point two weeks ago and decided, ooh, I'd better write the talk now. <laughs> so I stopped working on it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I still can't do TFTP boot, which is one of my names. The other problem is that K Linux plus init ramfus is huge. So, the other problem is that our main development is not for Linux, it's for Cell 4. And we can't at the moment k-exec into Cell 4 because Cell 4 assumes, because it's really, really lazy, that all of the clocks and voltage dividers have already been set up by the time its boot, its boot section is called. So that's actually a bug in our uh, initial initialization code that we need to fix, but uh, yeah. So, on the Beagle C3, we have 1.9 meg of NAND flash in the partition which U-boot fits. So I want to fit into that. If I use the best compression mechanism I, I can with this particular kernel and initial RAM disk, and I tried all of them to work out which one was smallest, it turned out to be LZO this time, we start out at 2.3 megabytes. That's good, that's only 400K we've got to get rid of. Um, it's 6.6 .6 megabytes uncompressed, so executing place is going to be a long way off. Okay, first thing to try and do is to compile the kernel in thumb2 mode. The ARM has two instruction sets, the EABI, which every instruction is 32 bits long, with, yeah, and thumb2 mode, where about half the instructions are only 16 bits. So if we compile both users, the kernel in um, thumb2 mode, we should get space savings, yeah? Well. It got down to 5.7 meg. Uh, I don't know where all the space is going yet, but it's still 2.1 meg compressed. Didn't gain enough. All right. Um, I was hoping to be able to boot across a wireless um, USB dongle. Um, as we haven't got USB, I don't care. So let's remove all the wireless bits. Down to 5.5 meg and 1.9 meg. We're almost there. It just needs to be a tiny bit more. So, compile user space in thumb2 mode, and the compiler starts blowing up uh, in Zlib. When it tries to build the uclibc version of Zlib, uh, it gets internal compiler errors. Try to download a newer version of the compiler from Debian, and their repositories are screwed up. So, build your own compiler, GCC 4.6, and manage to compile in thumb2 mode and now we've got 5 megabytes and 1.88 megs compressed. Yay! We can fit in there flash. And I suggest you go to Russ's talk later, he just walked in, hooray, to find out where else we might be able to trim some space. So, where is all the space going? Well, as far as Linux is going, this is just using size and adding together the text da and data size. I don't care about BSS at the moment. <clears throat> Init ID is 1.2 meg. Drivers are 870k. The file system code is 620k, net code is 450k, Ker the kernel itself is 240k, and the architecture dependent stuff is 220k, and everything else is small, relatively speaking. Where can we get rid of some stuff? Well, I'll talk about NSRD later, because it's a separate problem. Let's look at drivers. 193k for the USB drivers. 
That's because I don't know, for the C3 version of the BeagleBoard, which kind of USB um, network dongle I'm going to be plugging into it. So 193K. The MTD stuff, for talking to NAND flash, 124K. You can't read that, but that's the video stuff for driving the uh, HDMI, HDMI port. I think we can probably get rid of that one, 109K gone, yay. SCSI MMC layers are not that big, about 120K altogether, 130K altogether. So it looks like we could get rid of some stuff if I got rid of some of the USB drivers and got rid of MTD. There's no fat in the init ID. I'm just using BusyBox, and I've got a minimal set of POSIX compliant tools, plus the flash tools for burning the, um, the NAND flash, plus E2FS CK, because half the time, because you're running on the embedded system, um, the power goes off because you just pull the plug instead of doing a reboot properly, or you just push the reset button because things go crazily wrong. And you do need to be able to FS CK the file systems. On the XM board, where you haven't got any flash, you can get rid of all the MTD stuff and you get all, rid of all the flash stuff and that would save a lot of point. But what's the point? You haven't got a size limit on the XM. So the other problem is we've got lots of drawbacks. The new boot kernel has to be built specifically for a platform in order to get it small enough and so that you can put in those hard-coded uh, machine ID and board ID parameters. But that's okay, U-Boot also had to be built specifically for a particular thing. Dash U-Boot has fixes to work around buggy for hardware. These fixes need to be identified and ported into the Linux code. Otherwise, when you k-exec, even if you use U-Boot, if you then k-exec from the kernel you, you used U-Boot to get into and into a new kernel, the new kernel can't see the USB host, um, it can't see bits of the video display, yeah, it's pretty bad. It's huge still, and it's much, much slower to get to a prompt than U-Boot was. I'll show you in a minute how it all works. So what next? For ARM, I want to finish BMAP. I want to fix it up so that uh, we can move the initial RAM disk somewhere other than directly adjacent to the kernel. That might mean sticking before the kernel. That, that might work. I, I experiment and find out. Extend KExec to handle other than Linux. That's probably going to mean not going through the full shutdown sequence, but leaving some clocks and voltage dividers set up so that operating systems that expect those to have been set up by the bootloader actually have the environment they expect when they get there. It also means finding out what, say, WinCE or whatever needs in terms of uh, a ATAGS-like thing and setting it up appropriately. I don't know what that is at the moment because I haven't tried it yet. The other thing I want to be able to do is store some environment in Flash. Or even on the XM, even though you haven't got any NAND Flash, there's some Flash available on the I2C bus that you can talk to. It's not very big, but it's enough to install some environment variables to control your boot process. Uh, I haven't done anything that, about that yet. And finally, attempt to shrink Linux and NetRamphus even more. Um, U-Boot's 300k, about. The kernel of the NIT I've got is around about 1.9 meg. It's huge. And finally, on other platforms than the BeagleBoard, ex examine execute in place ideas. The idea here is if we can do execute in place, we can get rid of the X loader as well and start just with that 64k of static RAM that we have during the very early boot and then initialize the, the DDR memory ourselves and relocate ourselves into it if we need to. But so far, we can't do it. The other thing that'd be interesting to do, oh, investigate SMP issues. KExec has had a checkered history of whether it'll boot into an SMP system on ARM. I believe the problems have been fixed recently, so you can use KExec on the Panda board. Uh, there was a whole swag of KExec fixes that went in about two weeks ago into the Linux mainline. But I haven't tried it yet because we've only got two Panda boards and they're both in use all the time. Come on, where's my next slide? Uh, this, I think the batteries are going. Come on, where's my next slide? Okay. 
Next, I want to investigate trying to do a similar thing on x86 and get rid of grub. Um, at the moment, the way that uh, the way that um, an x86 system boots is that on a disk there's an MBR which contains 384 bytes of assembly language. It runs in real mode, 16-bit mode, and does BIOS calls to read the next 64K of stuff off the disk, uh, which contains a second stage bootloader. That then runs, and for Grub and for Lilo, it contains a list of blocks. Yeah, Matthew, you got a problem? Sorry. Yeah, you're just yawning. <laughs> um, it can save a list of blocks for the Linux kernel, and or, or for the third stage loader in, in Grub. Well, I think they call it the second late stage because they've got a stage one and a half in between. Um, either way, you've got a list of blocks that you can download and, and read and then stick into memory and then pass control to. EFI-based systems, like Lingitanium, instead have a dedicated FAT partition. The EFI already understands how to read write on, and it can have FAT uh, device drivers and modules and commands built into it. And that's actually a much nicer approach in some ways. So, maybe we could put the image before the first partition or we could use separate partitions. You've only got 64K guaranteed between the bootloader, uh, sorry, between the MBR and the first partition boundary. That's not going to be big enough for all of Linux. You could move the partition boundary. I mean, after all, when one terabyte disks are really common, who cares about a few megabytes at the front? Or it might be even better to use a separate boot partition, because then it's explicit where the thing is. And if it's fat, it's simple enough for your boot services to be able to read it. <laughs> Sorry, Matthew. <laughs> so you would look something like this. You've got your boot image at the beginning, either in a separate partition or in um, the stuff. And then your MBR can just read that it's a big contiguous chunk, so it's easy to read, and you just transfer control to it. Are we having fun yet? So, where do you get it? I'll be releasing it as soon as I've done a little bit more control to um, tidying up. Probably as patches against UC Linux. What I want to do now is give you a demo. So, um, let me plug the BeagleBoard in. We're now talking to the U-boot. Um, and what I need to do now is tell it that I've got an MMC card. So I say MMC init. Uh, I can't spell. MMC. Oops, um, I've got the wrong version of U-boot on there. It's MMC space init. OK? Now, just because you've initialized the MMC card doesn't mean you can actually talk to it. The first thing you've got to do is make it talk to it. The easiest way to do that is to ask for information about the MMC card. OK, we've got an MMC card there. Now, we can load a kernel into memory. Um, how, what's the magic thing for that? Fat load MMC0. That says, load from a FAT file system on MMC partitions uh, number zero. You could actually put a colon zero there as well, but I don't care. Uh, and we're going to load it at some magic load address. And I'm going to load a file called uboot.bin, which happens to be my fake Linux thing. Now I can go to it. And it does the normal unconfessing Linux, blah, 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 blah. And eventually should give us a shell prompt. There it is. So now I can cd to slash media slash mmc blk 0 p1. And have a look at it. And that's the stuff that was on the, on the um, file system that uBoot used to boot. Uh, uBoot.bin there is not uBoot. <laughs> It's a, um, a Linux image that's been mapped up like I just showed you. I've got a little shell script in there called KB. This is what it does. It calls kexec-l and appends a whole heap of stuff for the command line, sets up the init ID, and sets up and, and loads a kernel. The current kernel I'm going to load is vmlinux blah, 
and so on. So let's just run it. Um, I've commented out the kexec.e, so let's just run that ourselves. And it runs. And this time we're running in a full Linux environment, um, instead of in BusyBox Blah. It takes a little while sometimes. Hey, it seems to have hung. I don't know why it's hung, but you can see this principle anyway. I'm going to push the reset button, and this time I'm going to hold down the user button, which forces it to load instead of the, that uboot.bin. So we go straight into there. Hey, that wasn't uboot, that was Linux. And we can do the same thing again. So now we've got the, the pre, this is the preboot Linux version. Can I spell? No, especially when I can't see what I'm doing. I've probably got this set up wrong. I've been running so many um, experimental kernels and user spaces that it's probably got an experimental user space that doesn't boot on the, on the card. And then, and you can see it's really easy to, to script because you've got the shell there. And theoretically, you could use your flash tools to burn this into flash if you had enough space, and all the rest of it. Oh, we've got to init. Hey, it's working better now. I don't know why I didn't do it the first time. OK. And there we go. Are there any questions? Uh, wait for the mic, please, so that uh, people out in the internet land can hear. Hi. Um, just wondering where the 1.9 megabyte limit came from, your target for the ARM size. Sorry? The 1.9 megabyte limit that you were aiming for? Yes. At the beginning. That's because of the uh, partition table in the NAND flash for the BeagleBoard version C2 and C3. Um, its partition table consists of a small partition for the X loader, then 1.9 meg for U-boot, then 128K for flash variables, and then a big chunk for um, Linux kernel and a big chunk for a boot file system. Who sets that? Is that set by That uh, is MLO? embedded into the U-boot source code and into the Linux mainland source code and into a number of other third-party operating systems. So it's just set up by TI and everybody's used it since. I mean, you could change it, but then you'd be incompatible with everybody else. Anyone else? Got any more questions? There's one up this end. Um, have you looked at like Linux BIOS and those got what those guys are doing to try and like get rid of anything apart from Linux? So you don't even need a bootloader; you just boot straight to Linux. Uh, no, I have not. Um, Last time I looked at that kind of thing, and I'm not sure about this particular group, they were only really looking at x86. Uh, my focus is ARM, and to a lesser extent, other embedded platforms. Linux BIOS is renamed Core Boot. Yeah. We've got another five minutes or so of questions. Yep. yep. Sorry, I'm not sure if this is a silly question or not. Probably is. Yeah, I don't mind silly questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, at one point you mentioned um, concatenating uh, an init RD and a kernel image together. Yes. What's the benefit of doing that instead of just, as opposed to just not generating an init RD? Oh, um, the, the point is that you want your bootloader to be self-contained. Ah. So you, because the um, XLO code, the XLoader code is really, really dumb. It just wants a, a one file that it loads into memory and then passes control to. If you had the initial ID separately, if you, or tried to do without initial vampus, if you tried to do without initial vampus, you need a, a file system somewhere that can use as a boot file system. <coughs> so either you've got to embed it into your uh, Linux image, or you've got to have a separate initial vampus. And the XLoader code won't currently load a separate initial vampus. Uh, could we not use the main file system? 
No, because you want completely different user space. You want something small. You, the, the question was, could you not use the main fi file system? Firstly, you may not be booting Linux, so you may not have one. Secondly, you want something which is scripted to do the automatic booting or provide the boot environment that you actually want that's controlled. Yeah, you you don't want some directory. random stuff. You put it to a directory, but that doesn't make yeah. Uh, that's right. Any other questions? Yeah. Are the problems with the clocks missing uh, part of the shutdown from KXX or part of the boot up in the new kernel? Both. Um, ideally, Linux would not rely on what U-Boot has set up. So Linux itself should set up clocks. Conversely, some other operating systems, including the Cell 4 one that we want to use, do rely on the boot environment having been set up correctly for some value of correct. And therefore, we need to be able to change the KXX shutdown process so that we can avoid shutting down the bits that we still want. So there's two, there's two phases. We want to be able to fix the beginning so you can boot Linux directly without U-Boot. And we want to fix the end so that for operating systems that do require particular clocks and voltage dividers to be set up, they are set up. And I'm not quite sure what the best way to do that at the moment is. Uh, first thing to do is to find out which of those hundreds of clocks that the OMAP has is the one that's not being set up correctly. <laughs> and I haven't done that yet. Given that... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Josh. Given that there are several possible ways on different platforms to boot <coughs> kernels, for example, on x86 16-bit versus direct 32-bit mm -hmm. booting, it seems like it would make sense for KExec to have some notion of how do you want to boot this, mm. and that would fit for this as well. Do you want magic initialization done or not? That code is already there, because you can already boot uh, preserving the environment, as it were. Um, so there's at least two flavors already of boot, and there's no reason why we shouldn't add more. There are no other questions? Oh, yeah. Another back there. <laughs> you keep talking about making it possible to boot other operating systems. Yes. Uh, other than Linux, well, you're not going to be booting Windows 8, so nope. which ones are you planning on? Cell 4 and various other Cell 4-like things. Um, possibly WinCE, but uh, we haven't decided yet. Uh, Cell 4 is the one we really won't be able to boot. <coughs> it's the secure embedded L4 that is our main research focus. Simon. Yay, the KExec tools maintainer. I was, I was just wondering if a different approach to the clock problem might be to initiate, initialize the clocks in purgatory, which is a shim that goes between the two kernels, um, rather than to make potentially invasive changes to the shutdown path in the kernel itself. Um, just yep. an idea I had just now. Yes, that, that, that might be a really, really good way of doing it. I haven't explored purgatory yet. I saw the code there. I, I read it, didn't not, understand it. I would advise not exploring it unless you have to, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes. But this may be a valid reason to, uh, to yeah. go in there. It did look like uh, something like that might be good, uh, and that would solve a lot of problems. Right, because it would be agnostic and, it, and without tainting the kernel. The, the, it still doesn't fix the booting Linux directly without U-boot problem, unless you can somehow run purgatory on startup. No, so the boot path obviously has to be fixed. I'm more concerned about not okay. mangling the shutdown path. Yes, yes. Okay, now that'd be good. <coughs> okay, I repeat, are we having fun yet? <laughs> That's it. No questions, we might rack, uh, wrap up. Please thank Peter Chubb. <laughs>